Welcome to the Be Ready for the World Conference. I'm Bridget from Cambridge University Press and I'll be hosting your webinar today. I'm delighted to be joined by Margaret Coos, who will be taking you through this session on how to use language in the non-language classroom. Margaret is a language specialist, an author and a teacher trainer, and she works specifically in international teaching contexts. So before we get started, I just want to run through a few things. You'll notice that your microphones are all on mute. This is because we've got quite a lot of you in the session today, so we're trying to avoid any background noise. Uh, both Margaret and myself are both hosting this session from home, so please do bear with us if we have any technical difficulties. There'll be time at the end of the conference for a Q&A session, so please post any questions you have for Margaret in the Q&A chat box at the bottom of your screen. You can see this by hovering your mouse over the bottom. Um, there is also a chat box where you can put any comments in, um, but please put all your questions for Margaret in the Q&A box so they don't get lost. Um, if you have got any technical difficulties, our team will do their best to help you out. So just pop into the chat box. We'll do our best to resolve this. But don't worry too much if something happens because we are recording this webinar and we'll be able to send you a YouTube link after the session. Um, we recommend you listen via headphones for best sound quality. Um, but apart from that, I think that's all from me. So now to hand over to Margaret to start this session. Thanks, Margaret. Great, thank you very much, Bridget. Um, thank you all for joining me today. Um, I know you've had a busy day, lots of really interesting sessions. So I'm hoping that I'll be able to add something for you to ponder overnight before you carry on with the next two days. There's a lot to think about. Um, so we're going to talk about using language effectively in the non-language classroom. And to start off with, my slides aren't moving. Start off with, I'm going to take you back in time a little bit. Um, a number of years away, and I remember being able to make a pot of tea and to serve it exactly the way the owner wanted it done. Um, now, this new member of staff was from China, and quickly as I started doing this I realized that it wasn't really easy for him to understand it and I was a bit confused at first I thought this isn't a difficult thing to do but I became aware that it was the language I was using that was confusing him it wasn't a challenging task but when you think about some of the language such as this that I've put on screen he looked totally confused this was the language barrier so this is what we were and we're going to talk about today. What stopped me being successful in telling him how to make a pot of English breakfast tea? How do we recognize it? Uh, we'll come back to those instructions for making tea later on. Now, we're really lucky, I think, all of us, in working in a bilingual context. And this is an amazing thing. But what does that mean? We need to have a common understanding so that we know what our learners need for us to be able to support them. And interestingly, the idea of being bilingual has changed over the years. So I thought we'd start off by looking at some definitions. Here's the first. And there's another one. And finally. Now, you'll be able to see through these that the, the idea of bilingualism has changed quite a lot. And if I add the authors and the dates, you can see that the first one is shockingly nearly 90 years old. Even the third one here is already over a decade old. This is the idea that we most commonly work towards nowadays individuals who routinely use two or more languages for communication in varying contexts. And I thought there's two things that are interesting here, two or more. It's the recognition that our learners may be working in a second language, but they may be working in a third or a fourth language. And that's very impressive. But also the idea of the language being used in different contexts. And this may be social, course is education 
and schools. And our learners don't arrive on their first day with us with all the language skills and the knowledge that they need to understand all of the course that we're going to teach them. They're learning as they go. As they make progress in your subject, they're making progress in their language ability as well. And that's, they're very complementary things. They work together very well. So it's a very positive thing. And this means two things to us really. In effect, every classroom is a language classroom. And every teacher, including you, a language teacher. Now, some subject teachers tell me they don't have expertise in teaching language. They don't want the responsibility. But in actual fact, you're doing it every day, whether you know it or not. So what I want to look at today is to think about how to make you more aware of it and hopefully to develop a, an interest in language matters as well, which I think is always a good thing, in my opinion. Why is this important? Well, when we aren't aware of the power of language, we could be making a judgment about learning and understanding without really understanding, is it the subject that's an issue or is it the language? Is this learner confused because the maths isn't clear or is it because they don't have the language skills to understand your explanation of how to carry out an equation, for example? You could end up wasting a lot of time going over a subject content matter, a subject point, when really it's not that the fact that that's too complex, it's that they just don't understand some of the words you're using to describe it. So we come back to that language barrier. We recognize that there is such a thing. We need to think about how we break it. And we can break that down into three different elements. Firstly, we have to be able to recognize the language ability of our learners. What do they have a good understanding of now? What have they partially learned but still struggle with? And what is above their level at the moment? But on the other side of that, we have to think about the demand of the language that they face. Um, now, texts which are specifically written for bilingual contexts, such as many as the Cambridge texts, uh, are designed with language support built in. But this isn't always the case, and you might need to look at the material you use and analyse that yourself and think, hmm, is this language challenging? Is it about the right level? What do I need to think of feeding into my lesson planning to support my, my students? Well, this sounds easy, don't we? We recognise the language ability, recognise the bond, and then we just fill the gap. Well, it's not quite as simple, but um, that's what I'm going to try and give you some hints on today to thinking about filling that gap. And this is partly by playing our role as language teachers in the classroom, thinking about the teaching we do. But it's also about reviewing the content that we put in front of our learners or indeed expect them to produce. So we're going to look at these three areas one by one. So first of all, thinking about recognizing language ability. How do we go about this? Well, there's some useful linguistic tools to help us. One of the most useful distinctions is to be aware of the difference between social language and academic language. Now, I've taught on a number of courses where I've heard teachers saying that their learners pretend not to understand in the classroom. They hear them outside in the corridor, in the playground, chatting quite easily with their friends. But there's a difference between the demands and the different settings. Social language, we can refer to as fixed or basic interpersonal communication skills, which is exactly what it says. It is more basic. It's about really informal, really low stress situations, the sort of language which you use very commonly and hear a lot. On the other side of the coin, the academic language we can refer to as help cognitive academic language proficiency. It already sounds more complex, doesn't it? It's often more formal, it's more specific. And interestingly, the vocabulary that's used isn't used as often. So it can be quite challenging for learners to learn the vocabulary they need for their lessons. 
And just as importantly, however friendly or high stakes situation than our learners chatting with their friends outside school. And this has an impact on the learner's use of language. So some examples here of kelp that you might hear in the, in the school context. The important thing in social language doesn't necessarily mean fluency in academic language. And problems arise where teachers assume that those learners they hear chatting away outside have the ability to do that in the classroom in a different setting with different language to the same level. In fact, whether English is a first language or a second language, learners need sport and time to develop proficiency in academic language. And this is what we expose them to in the school environment. The big kelp distinction is often likened to an iceberg with the Bix being the top level there that you can see, it's above the water, it's clear, it's familiar, it's recognisable. But kelp is the less obvious language. And it isn't always clear whether our learners know it until we present them with it, or indeed if we ask them to use it, and they can't. And that can be very frustrating for them if they think, well, I know this science, I just can't put it into words. So the second point we needed to think about was recognising the language demand, the other side of the coin. And when we think about these areas, there's, again, three sub areas we can look at. The grammar and vocabulary is possibly the most obvious, but just as important, the complexity of the language and also the length. And we'll look at some examples of this in a minute. Um, the third thing here is the skills, and these are the language skills. What do we want our students to do with the language? Are they listening or reading, receptive language skills, or do we want them to produce something, to speak or to write? So we have to consider all three of these areas when we're thinking about the demand, which is in our lesson content. And I thought we'd start off by looking at some grammar and vocabulary examples. Um, we're going to look at two sentences with the same meaning, I'd like you to read these through and just think, which one do you think is more difficult for learners to understand? This is based on science. I'll give you a minute to read these. So there's a few features for us to look at here. Let's go through them one by one and we'll see whether you were right. Well, firstly, in the, the language in the second sentence is more complex where we've got this, these purple words. Uh, the verb darken um, has the same meaning as to get darker, but for students to understand this, they need to understand that an adjective can be changed into a verb by adding en, so darken, shorten, lengthen, and here it's in the past. It's not necessarily very complex language, but they have to have a, do a little bit more work than just understanding got darker. Secondly, the words in red here, both of them have the same function. They're conjunctions and they're showing a contrast. But the word in the first sentence, but, very definitely a Bix level word, whereas, whereas in the second sentence, very definitely kelp. Same meaning, but the students having to do a little bit more work to deal with more difficult vocabulary in the second example. And here we're thinking about nouns. So in the first sentence, we've got the substance and test tube. And in the second sentence, we're using substitutes of the nouns, alternatives, that and one. Now, that might look like a better style, it's not as repetitive, but we're making our students do a little bit more work there again. And finally, the difference here at the end of the two sentences, um, we've used something called ellipses in the second sentence by leaving out the rep repetition of get darker. Um, by leaving it out, we're recognizing that usually you would understand we're referring to the same thing, but for our learners who are using a second language, they just have to do a little bit more cognitive processing to be able to understand that. 
So overall, the second sentence might look more stylistically elegant, but it's more challenging for our learners. Let's have a look at another example. This time it's based on history. And again, I'll give you a second to read through this. So what do we think here? Well, in the first sentence, there's definitely more complex grammar. This is the passive form. It has been debated. We don't know who is doing the debating. That might be understood from the text, but it might not be as obvious. The second example sentence tells you who's doing it, the historians. Much easier for students to understand. They can grasp hold of the doer of the sentence. So a difference between the grammatical forms there. Now, in the two examples, we've got the same word, which signals a contrast in both sentences. And it's a really useful word. As soon as a, a student sees the word, however, they know they're getting a contrast. But in the first sentence, it's hidden away in the middle of the word, uh, middle of the sentence, sorry. So the student has to read before they know there's a contrast coming. Much more supportive, put it at the front, as soon as the student sees that word, they know they're getting an early signal of what sort of information is coming. Now, here's an example of a specific word which has a more common meaning in the first sentence, fuel. Obvious, the usual meaning, petrol, oil for cars, um, food for the body, for example. But in this sentence, the meaning is less obvious. In the second sentence, I've used the alternative word caused, doesn't change the meaning, but it's less confusing for candidates, they are for students, they don't have to think about the, the use of fuel in this context. And finally, we've got the same noun at the end of the sentence here with revolution. But in the first sentence, it's used rather abstractly. In the second one, with the another, it's making it more concrete. So very similarly with the, um, the science examples, whereas the style of one sentence is maybe a little bit better, the clarity is sometimes lost. So we can summarize this uh, overall, thinking about words. Generally, shorter words, easier to understand, but not always. Remember that example of darker, get darker, darken, get darker. So we have to think all. Uh, more sentences and fewer conjunctions. If you can break language up into chunks, it's more supportive, easier for our learners to understand. And thinking at whole text level, Something that has more paragraphs and is maybe broken up with bullet points, um, it looks more accessible and generally our learners can break it up in their mind and find it easier to understand. The last point I've got under text is referencing and this refers to the use of pronouns like it, them, their. And this can be very confusing for learners, so I thought it was useful for us just to step aside and look at an example there. So here's two very simple sentences. What could be confusing? He gave her a book, it made her very happy. Well, it's the it, the referencing. What made her happy? Could be one of three things. It could be the book. Um, she'd been looking for that book for ages, hunted in all the bookshops. Finally, she's got it. Could be the giving. It was her birthday, no one else had remembered. Thank goodness someone had remembered. Maybe it was him. She'd been, been in love with him for ages. She doesn't care what the book is, but he had thought of her. Now, here in the context of the text, you would probably be able to work it out. But if you imagine your learners reading a long text about geography or history or science, every time they see one of these pronouns, they have to think, what does this refer to? So this is another example of where sometimes we would sacrifice style and put in some repetition to make the text more accessible for our learners to understand. So let's move on to the next area. We talked about skills being important. 
And within language learning, we consider we have four skills. And you can see here in red, we've got the reading and in yellow, uh, sorry, in green, the listening. So both of these receptive skills. So something to think about here is when you're giving instructions for a class to do an activity, are you going to write them down? So students have time, they have a reference to go back and reread. Or are you going to read something out? You're going to give them orally. Listening is a very important skill, of course, to develop, but there is an extra element of stress. Um, with reading, students can go back and reread. With listening, it's very immediate, so it can make it very stressful. With the productive skills, the yellow of writing and the blue of speaking, same way they're producing language in both situations and some learners will prefer one or the other um, but in some way we're making a judgment about our learners based on what they produce when they write they have to think about spelling and we know english spelling isn't easy i'm sorry about that when they speak they have to think about pronunciation I'm afraid English pronunciation is quite erratic at times as well. So there's an extra challenge there. Again, both of them important skills, but we need to think about how do we support our, our learners in the classroom in showing their subject content through these skills. And of course, in real life situations and in the classroom, we usually integrate these skills. We very rarely do one skill without doing something else. So, for example, asking your learners to read a passage and then discuss their answers with a partner. They're reading, they're speaking, they're listening. They might also be writing something down, making some notes. It's interesting that research into second language learning has shown that learners don't always transfer the skills they have in their first language to their second language. And an example of this would be in reading. It's very unusual in your first language to pick something up and to read it straight away without having an idea of what's in that text. If it's a newspaper, you're skimming down. If it's a book, maybe you read the blurb on the back cover. If you're looking at a, an article online, you'll scan down, see what it's about. We need to make sure that we incorporate these subskills into our classroom practice. Now your learners will be taught this in their language classroom, but it's a useful thing to incorporate into your subject classroom as well. And I'll show you a couple of examples of that later on. So we've talked about recognizing the level of ability of our learners, and we've talked about the language demand, the important bit, filling the gap. Uh, the very important bit is recognizing that in order to be successful and to make sure that we have the best chance of beating that language barrier we have to incorporate language support into our planning and at a high level there's a very useful tool which we can use to think about the language we're using in our classroom and it links back to our discussion earlier about Bix and help so this is a quadrant uh, which was designed by someone called Jim Cummins and he thought about language in the classroom in four different areas and you can see the different axes going across and up and down. If you look in the middle, the axis there talks about the language on whether it's basically easy or more challenging. Going across the ways, we can think about the context. Is there a clear context or is the context not quite as clear, which can make things more difficult? So to give you some examples, if we think about quadrant A there, so here the language is easy and it's got a strong context. So here's an example. A group of students talking in the playground with friends, possibly looking at their phones, showing each other something. So very relaxed atmosphere, lots of context, relatively easy language. If we think about B, we're thinking about the same sort of ease of language, but the context is not quite as strong. So our students may be reading a list of materials required for a trip. Both of these two, A and B, we can think of as being BICs. This is our everyday social language. When we move down to C and D, we're moving into the world of CALP here. So in quadrant C, our language has got more difficult, but we're still thinking there's a clear context. 
So an example here, science experiment by following the teacher doing a demonstration. Now you can imagine that the student standing around following what the teacher is doing and be able to link their description to the actions that they see. So the context there is really strong. If we took that same experiment and made the context less supportive, we might end up with this. Doing the same experiment, but by reading the directions from a book, I hope you can see that there's definitely less support there. So our job when we think about the language we want to use in the classroom is thinking about the tasks and hopefully moving as much as we can from quadrant D into quadrant C. So this is a really useful matrix to keep in mind when you're planning your lessons and thinking about the language support they need. So having thought about this, let's think about the practicalities. How can you systematically include language in your planning? Again, three elements, and we'll go through them one at a time. Vocabulary is really important, and I thought we might return to that example of making the cup of tea as an example of this. You'll remember my situation teaching my colleague. So I wrote down some instructions as an example. I'll give you a moment to read that. So you may make a cup of tea in a different way, um, but whichever way you make it, there is some vocabulary there, which I would consider if I was teaching this cup of tea making class to be vital. And I've chosen these four nouns here, kettle, teapot, tea, teaspoon. So they would all go in my lesson plan and I would know I need to teach those somehow. But there's other words and phrases which are essential too. But they may apply to other lessons. So I may make the assumption that maybe the students know this, maybe they don't. I chose the verbs here, fill, boil, pour, swill, draw. So I may need to check before I teach this lesson, have these been taught by another colleague in another subject, maybe in physics, science, maybe in a practical subject. And we'll come on later to thinking about a whole school approach and how we try to link up. But we can't just presume that because they're not specific to my cup of tea making lesson, that they will be known. I need to think about how do I know that my students know this. There's quite a lot of vocabulary there just for this simple task. So looking back, it's not really surprising that that colleague of mine found this difficult. I was throwing a lot of information at him. But what does it mean, learning a word? I think back to my language learning history. And when I lived abroad, I used to carry around my little dictionary. And when I found a word I didn't know, I would look it up. And I looked later on and I found, oh, I'm looking up a word and I've already highlighted it. That's really annoying. I thought I'd learned that. Later on, I read articles that indicated you need to have exposure to a word or to have used it about 17 times before it becomes an active part of your vocabulary. Now, the first time I read that, I thought, oh, that's ridiculous. That's so many times. That's impossible. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought, actually, I think this is about right. And what, of course, we have to remember is we said our BICS language is everyday language. We would reach those 17 exposures very quickly. Now, in the hour before this, uh, before I came online to meet you, I just thought of the words that I'd seen through, which could be considered BICS, cat, address, fill in, door, answer. Very common. You can imagine our students seeing those all the time. And I was just doing a little bit of proofreading on a task, which included the words siphon, instigate, reflect. I can't remember the last time I used the word siphon. So if we taught that word to our students, how are we going to make sure that they use it enough times that it becomes a part of their active vocabulary? We have to do something to help them. 
all of the research has shown that learning vocabulary is vital. And here is a quote from an American educational researcher that I thought was useful. The importance of direct vocabulary instruction cannot be overstated. Vocabulary provides essential background knowledge and is linked to academic achievement. I totally agree. So although we don't have much time to look at this today, I wanted to spend a little bit of time just looking at some strategies for CARP development. So these are all ideas that you could use uh, within your classroom to support your learners with their vocabulary. Guessing the theme of the lesson from the vocabulary displays on the word if you have a, a dedicated classroom that you could use. Even translation, that's still a valuable thing to use within the classroom. Second area really referred to functional language, thinking about what are the cognitive skills needed for this lesson? And in our lesson on making a cup of tea, this included sequencing. So here I've highlighted first, next, then, before. So if I don't have confidence that my learners understand these words, they won't be able to describe the process. Other functional areas might include describing, contrasting, linking ideas, showing outcomes. It would depend on the subject. And we talked about the skills that we need in our lessons. Um, whatever the skill is, whichever one we choose, we need to think about how we provide support, how we provide scaffolding. This could include things like just allowing thinking time so that our learners have time to process something in the second language. They're working a bit harder than they would be if they were in their first language. We talked about watching a demonstration Having some time to make notes before speaking, the think, pair, share to take the pressure off speaking in class. Reading chunks of text and answering questions rather than reading a whole text so that you're able to concept check and to predict what's coming next, that can be really useful. A model text before they have to produce something is really valuable. And the idea of speaking or writing frames, which you may or may not be familiar with, Got a couple of examples here to show you for writing. So this is an example writing frame with less support. It gives an outline of what I expect my learner to produce against this topic area, an idea of how much text and the three areas. The next example has a bit more support. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that my learners have less subject knowledge. It means that they might may provide need more support in their writing. So I've talked about a lot of different areas here. There's a lot to think about, but what about the practicalities? Really a whole school approach is vital if we're going to be in the best position to support our learners. And one of the key documents it's useful to look at is to think about your language policy. So a language policy which is supportive and which, which is up to date is a great foundation for you. When you get back to your schools, check and see what's in your language policy. Hopefully it supports working cross department. So it's not just thinking about individual, but thinking about the links. There will be links between maths and economics, for example. The recognition that there are areas which are in common and the language requirements. So that's thinking back to our cup of tea and all of those words which we think they're not specific to this lesson, but someone else might have taught these before. And really the key coming from that is the collaboration and the support you should require from your colleagues to think about how can we work together to make sure we're successful in this. There's a very useful document on the Cambridge International website, newly published, um, which gives hints. So if you have a language policy that you feel could do with some more input, there's a very useful link here can have a look it will give you the principles and also really useful checklists which will be able to adapt for your use thinking about other support um, the new resources for the cambridge primary and lower secondary have been designed with all of this language support that we've been talking about today in mind the global english of course covers english but i thought it'd be useful to look quickly at an example for maths and science so the maths here clearly shows the language functions at the top. The specific vocabulary is shown in use in uh, brown in the text. 
but also in a vocabulary box on the page. So that supports your planning because that work is already done for you. In the science example at primary, um, very similar, we've got the vocabulary in the box at the top. And I particularly like this one because it shows the uh, plural of property with the IES there. So you don't even have to think about that, but it's clearly set out for our learners. And some really nice visuals to support them at the bottom with the different adjectives. A very useful series of books, um, approaches to teaching and learning. I believe there are now 12 different subjects and they work around different content and strategies, such as active learning, metacognition, lots of downloadable lesson ideas to illustrate the points in the books. So that's a really valuable feature, I think. And if you are interested more in language, if I have sparked an interest, there is a whole series, The Cambridge Teacher, which will give you much more information than I'm able to in this very short presentation. My personal favourite, um, the English profile. This is a huge resource of language which has been collected, University of Cambridge, CUP, the British Council, University of Bedford, a lot of people have put into this. And it's a huge database which you can type in a word or some language and get an idea of what level it is. Now, I don't have time here to give you a lot of information, but there are some excellent videos and support material as well as the database there. It's free to use, and I think it's a really valuable resource. Before I finish, I'd like to leave you with my favorite tip for teaching in a bilingual non-language classroom. This is a really common question where you hear in our classroom. Pardon, could you repeat that? So we can imagine our teacher and learner. So now look at the page after the graph and answer the question. Could you repeat that, please? Oh, I want you to look at the, I want you to answer the questions which come on the next page. Now, this is a really common thing for any speaker to do in any language. We paraphrase. Now, it's a sociolinguistic device we do because we don't want the person to feel awkward that they haven't understood. But in the language classroom, it's actually not very useful. How poor learner. They probably understood some of the question, some of the instructions, but didn't understand everything. When they asked for a repetition, they got a completely new sentence. So they had to start again. So my final tip is if you're asked to repeat something in the classroom, use the same words. It's supportive. You might have to paraphrase later on, but give your learner a second chance to understand the exact instruction you've given them. I'm going to stop talking here. And um, thank you very much for, for coming along and joining me here. And now it's over to you and to Bridget to, to help me field these for any questions. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Margaret. Um, we're aware that um, some people have had a few sound quality issues, so we will ah. be sending the link. Um, but thanks all. It was such a useful session. I think we've got about five minutes for some questions. So I've seen some coming through. Um, so Hara says, hello. Is teaching science and maths in a foreign language, so in English in an Arabic school, is it considered a barrier for understanding these subjects or is it considered an opportunity for more exposure to the foreign language? Really I good think question. Really good, a really interesting question. It's definitely an opportunity. There is so much evidence now and as a non-scientist, I, I'm just stunned by this, but there is a lot of evidence that young people who become bilingual, who start their life as bilingual and go through bilingual education, have so many advantages. Their use of language, it isn't a matter that they're switching between the two languages, they learn to integrate the two. There's evidence that uh, people who grow up truly bilingual have a much lower chance of developing dementia which is just fascinating and something which you would never have thought of. I think it's a real opportunity. Um, I think you're at a huge advantage if you are teaching one of these subjects as a non-native speaker, because you have been through the process of learning the language. So you have much more insight about the challenges than uh, a native English speaker would have teaching in your context. So I think it's a huge, huge advantage and it's much more interesting. Great. Great Thanks question. For that question. 
Um, so we've got another one from Rashmi. So as you all as you all know, pronunciation differs from place to place, country to yes. country. So if your pronunciation is different sometimes, is it right to question the person's ability of his her English language speaking? I would say no. Um, there's evidence now that suggests that pronunciation is very much mixed up with your identity. And we see this when people go to live in different countries. They can speak a second language or a third really, really well, but they still have quite strong pronunciation. That's about who they are. I now live in Scotland. I was born in England. I don't think I will ever lose my English accent, maybe because I'm too old now that I've moved, but it's part of my identity. And I think there's a recognition now that as long as you're comprehensible, you can be understood. That's the most important thing. I think pronunciation, I always loved teaching pronunciation, but I think it's less important and it is so much mixed up with who you are. We've got another question a bit linked to that. So what methodology can be used to help teachers of other subjects in pronunciation and use of language? Wow. Well, I think building this awareness, some of those, those books that I mentioned, um, the Timothy Chadwick book in particular is really useful for this. But if you have an interest in language, um, maybe I should have put together a reading list for this. I, we can certainly provide something. But developing a, an interest in language will really help your classroom teaching. I think pronunciation is less important. I think being aware of the language that you find in your course material that you use in class and being able to analyze it is quite useful. Um, one of the best things I've seen people do is to go and do an initial um, teacher training course in teaching English as a foreign language. The CELTA course um, is very, very valuable. There are a lot of these which are available online now. And I know um, people that I know who've been teaching for many years, when they've gone to teach in other countries, they've realised, actually, I need an extra layer here of being able to analyse the language. But I can certainly pull some ideas together. I always like to support anyone who wants to learn about language. <laughs> um, I do feel quite passionate about it. <laughs> I've got another question. So how would you know what language will be difficult for your learners? This is just a question when I was putting the presentation. OK, well, I think this is um, where something like the English profile can really come into its own. It's a really valuable resource where you can um, go online and you sign up, you need a, a password, but it's free, you don't get lots of spam, you can type in the word or the structure, and you can get an idea and it's broken down by something called the CEFR level, Common European Framework of Reference. So this is a very established method of saying which level of language certain items are. And it's uh, developed in groups A, B, and C, and within that, A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, C2. Um, A1 is the bottom, and if something comes up at A1, you would think this is very everyday, simple language. If something comes up at C2, you think this is much more complex. I need to think about, can I simplify this? Can I find synonyms for it? Do I need some visuals to support my language here? Because that's more complex. But I highly recommend the, the English folk profile. It's a really useful resource. Great. That's just about all we've got time for with this session. Um, just to say we will share the YouTube link with you. Thank you very much for joining us. This is actually the last session um, for today's conference. We'll be back with you tomorrow. So I hope you have a lovely evening and thank you again. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the conference.